Um, for those who are on a Mac and just installed VS Code for the first time, uh, you can uh, you can go through the first up. Okay, so just just to kind of get everyone up to speed on what's going on here. So for the for this next next hour, what I really want to do is a few things. One is for those who've brought their laptops, I would love to get you guys to install Leo and Alio so you guys can try it on your devices with me. Uh, it is the full zero knowledge compiler, so like you can do everything that I'm doing on stage. There's nothing. There's no fancy magic happening here. Uh, for for those who want to kind of see the examples on their own, the the workshop repo that I'm actually going to be using is this one here. It's uh, github.com slash aliohq slash workshop. You'll see it on, this, on the left side in just a moment. Uh, but I just want to call out, this is kind of the examples we'll be going through, just so that everyone gets a sense of what's happening here. Um, and so with that, let's jump into things. Uh, the, first, the first thing is uh, to call is, there's probably going to be bugs. I ask that you file a GitHub uh, pull request if you, or GitHub issues if you see bugs. Um, you know, we're obviously in testnet, and it's an important part of the community to, to make sure that we're, we're doing our best on every one of these fronts. Um, but with that, there's a few prerequisites in order to install Alio uh, and Leo. Um, the first is that you need Git on your machine. Um, so uh, for those who have a new device, if you just go into command line or terminal, or I guess a Mac, if, if you're on a Mac, you go into terminal, you type Git, it will automatically give you the option to install it. Um, separately, you'll need to install Rust. And so for those uh, who don't have Rust yet, you can go to bit.ly slash start dash Rust. It will take you to this, oops, it'll take you to this page. Uh, if you just copy paste this, this line into your terminal, uh, you'll be able to install Rust on your machine. And uh, lastly, for those uh, who don't have an IDE, and specifically the one I will be using is VS Code, uh, you can go to bit.ly slash start dash VS Code. And uh, there will be three options, Windows, uh, Ubuntu variants, uh, and, uh, or yeah, Linux variants, sorry, and uh, also Mac. Uh, and uh, you know, this will be the IDE that I'm using for examples. Uh, if you already have a preference on an IDE out there, uh, there is actually uh, the ability to install our syntax highlighters on VS Code, on Sublime, and IntelliJ. So this is the VS Code kind of one, which is what we prefer. There is also Sublime, um, and there's instructions for that here. And there's also IntelliJ, and there's instructions for that here. So you can kind of pick your poison and, and choose what you'd like to use uh, for this next part here. Um, there are going to be two, two, two folks here, uh, Ray and Pranav, who are compiler and protocol engineers on the team. Uh, if you need any help, please raise your hand. They'll come around and help you with your device. Uh, they'll be able to kind of help de debug every step along the way here. There's five steps total. Uh, I anticipate the, the fourth step will probably take the longest amount of time, uh, but uh, it, it will be about eight to 10 minutes. Uh, all these other steps will kind of be solely dependent on uh, your internet speed and how quickly that, that goes. So um, with that, let, let's get this going. Um, I will basically spend... Uh, uh, five minutes on step one, and I will also ha help out where I can, uh, and then we'll move on to step two, three, four, and five, and uh, those, those should go a little quicker. Uh, countdown. Okay. Um, yeah, so for those who, who don't have Rust yet, just make sure you install this. Can I get a show of hands, actually, of who has a Rust installed on their machines? Okay, so, so about ha half the room, I'd say. So the other half should definitely go through and just do this. Uh, I haven't run into any issues with respect to installing Rust up. Uh, it's fairly straightforward if you just copy-paste this and you paste it in the command line. Uh, ba -ba. If you just paste it and run it, it should immediately start downloading and getting it going for you. Uh, you can pick which one you want, and so uh, you can, you know, in my case, I'll pick one, which is the standard install process. Um, I actually have Rust installed, but it'll just reinstall it, which is fine. Um, and so just to show everyone live what it's doing, this is uh, basically it. And also, how many people have VS Code on their devices? Can I get a show of hands? Oh, actually, quite a lot of people have VS Code. Okay, great. I'm, I'm glad it's been the ID of choice. I, was, I, I will admit I was trying to kind of guess what was the most popular option here, so I'm glad that it is VS Code. That'll save us some trouble.
Okay, and so after this rust up is finished, uh, I guess for the first time you also want to just put it in your source for, for this specific terminal so you can copy paste the source uh, home, just copy paste this line here and uh, paste it in. And once you paste it in, if you just hit enter, it will set this, uh, this install of Rust uh, into your environment, so that in your path variable, so that you can actually uh, start using this uh, uh, right off the bat here. And, and you can check that it works uh, by running cargo dash dash version. So cargo dash dash version will just tell you that I'm you know, currently on nightly on version 1.66. Um, probably also worth checking that you have git, which is just git dash dash version, and you can see I'm, I'm on version 2.37. And for those who have finished these steps, uh, make sure you download VS Code and just open up VS Code. Uh, for those who are new, this is what VS Code looks like, and this is the workshop repo that we'll be going through in just a moment. But this at least is the, this is VS Code and kind of its, its basics. Are there any issues people are running into? Oh, it's actually fairly smooth. Okay, I'm, I'm glad to see that. There's no, no trouble. <laughs> That's always a good sign. Okay, well, maybe, should we, should we proceed? Maybe I'll proceed. If, if, there's, if there's no issues and people are running smoothly, oh, yes, there's one there. Oh, my VS Code theme. You're actually gonna have this installed in just a minute. Uh, uh, on the next slide, uh, this, is, uh, this is the one that we use for Leo, so uh, you'll actually see it on yours. Uh, it'll look the exact same. It's, 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 it's a Leo theme, so yeah. It comes with syntax highlighting in it. <laughs> we, uh, we kill two birds with one stone here. All right, so let's go to the next step. Uh oh I think the battery might have died on it. Oh, there, oh, there's a laser pointer on this. Oh, this is great. All right. You learn something every day. Oh, there we go. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, for those who are on a Mac and just installed VS Code for the first time, uh, you, can, uh, you can go through the first upper part there. I'm going to use the laser pointer. Yeah, you can go through this, uh, and this will basically let you just run, like, from terminal. You can write code dot, for example, and it will open up VS Code for you. Um, it's kind of optional, but it's a, it's a nice little thing uh, if, you, if you want that. Uh, but for the rest of us, uh, everyone, uh, I want everyone to go uh, into the VS Code Marketplace. So let me just show you on my machine how it works. You click on this bar right here, uh, right there. And if you type Leo, uh, the first result that comes up is going to be this guy here. It's uh, Leo, the official VS Code extension. We just updated it last night, actually. So um, we just updated it. It is now on version uh, 35. Uh, make sure you're on version 35 if you're on an older version. Yeah, just click uninstall as so, uh, and then click, uh, or I guess you need to reload technically, so I'll reload. Let me type Leo in again. And let's click install together, so. It'll install it, and that's kind of it, and, uh, oh, I guess we're on version 36 now. Did we push an update? Oh, oh, okay, all right, we're on version 36 now, so make sure you're at least on 36 now. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> That was our timer, sorry. Um, and I'll also call out for those who are on other IDEs, like if you're on IntelliJ, um, there is similarly a, a ability to do this. Uh, you can go into your preferences, uh, you can go into plugins, uh, and you can, well yeah, I guess it's here, but you can type Leo, and uh, Leo is also available here. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong button, there we go. Yeah, it, Leo is also here and you just click, in, there, there'd be an install option under the marketplace or, yeah, here, let me show it from here. Yeah, so there's also an option here and you can just click the install button and it'll get it set up for you as well. So, oh, this one's actually, this one's interesting. This one's built by Haruka. He's a community member. Uh, uh, Haruka is amazing. I actually got to meet him for the first time like uh, over the summer. Uh, he's based in Japan, and uh, anyways, I, maybe I shouldn't get into too many details, but like he was a very, very good community contributor in Testnet 2, uh, was, was super helpful in building tooling, and uh, yeah, has been trying to also update everything for Testnet 3 as well, so there are other options. I would say the most up-to-date version, of course, is the one that we put out, and I would still strongly recommend you use this version here, so, um, but yes, there are, there are other folks who are also experimenting, and I think 
I think if you check in, in VS Code, there's also, there's also another one from, from another team, which is a test extension um, that was from earlier the year, in the year. Um, but yeah, there's, there's different approaches. So anyways, uh, I see the download uh, increment increment by four. So I, I, I don't know how, how real time it is, but just make sure you're installing it. Uh, I think this step is fairly clear. And so it, are there any issues on this step? Uh, if there are, uh, there are we've got, we got two, two folks who can help out on this front. Oh, the internet's bad? Oh, but I'm on a wired. Hold on. Let me, let me un unplug myself. Let's see. Let's see. On Alio Wi-Fi. Oops, not on my phone. Gosh darn it. Uh, Alio Wi-Fi. Oh, I should probably plug in. Good catch. Forget this guy. Redo it. All right, we're on Wi-Fi on this one as well. I'm kind of, I'm kind of curious what the speed is. Yeah, it could be improved, couldn't it? <laughs> is everyone good with step two, though? Did, did we all end up managing to get it? Yeah. All right. Okay. So I guess let's see if we can get the internet. Uh, let's see if we can get the internet up a bit. But nonetheless, let's let's keep moving forward. Oh, look at that. The upload's pretty good, but we don't really need the uploads here. Um, let's go on to the next step. So from there, uh, we want to clone the GitHub repo. So um, this is the workshop repo, as I was mentioning. Uh, with it, you basically want to git clone uh, the workshop repo. So that's the that's the full URL. You need to type it HTTPS colon slash slash github.com slash aliohq slash workshop. And uh, if you're having any issues with Git, like especially on a Windows machine, uh, what you can do is uh, just go to the URL here, click on the drop down, and then just download the zip. This is another option for how you can handle it. So. Actually, I should probably see how long it takes. Let's, let's do this together. Okay, all right, so that's how long it takes. <laughs> all right, with that, for those who have already uh, uh, cloned the workshop repo or have installed it, the next step is to open it. So um, CD into your workshop folder and then proceed to um, install it. The install script is fairly straightforward, so let me just clear things out here. Um, if I ls, oh, too high up, sorry. LS, you can see there is a install.sh. I can with that run the install script and I'll just run it with everybody so you can see it. This will proceed to install the latest version of Alio as well as the latest version of Leo. Um, it should be fairly, fairly straightforward, but this will take a few minutes. So on my machine, I already have the parameters that we're gonna need for the actual snarks. Uh, for the zero knowledge proofs already installed on this. On your case, uh, you'll need to install them and it will look something like this. So basically like as you go through it, you'll install a bunch of parameters that look like this. Um, your screen will look like this as it's going through and at the end when it finishes, it will say installation complete. Um, this step uh, from, from me running it on this Wi-Fi earlier today uh, on my own took about eight minutes in total. 
Um, let's give it. Let's give it eight minutes and let's see where everyone is at. Um, and uh, in the meantime, uh, once you get things off, like I, I want to start just with the eight minutes here and uh, show people how to kind of write some basic code here. Um, that way, we can kind of keep this moving along. All right. So while that's going, I want to write a uh, a token contract. I think this is probably one of the most canonical things you can do, and uh, it's probably important that we do this. So I'm going to just start by making a temporary directory. So we cd into the temp. For those who have Leo installed, you can already follow along with this, and then I'll showcase more examples with this. But basically, this is Leo. Leo it's, it is the is the it's a command line tool which has in it the compiler. Um, what I can do is I can create a new repository by writing Leo new token. If I hit enter, it will create this token folder for me. And with that, I can cd into token. And if I ls, you'll see there's a few files. There's the readme, there's a build folder, there's an inputs folder, and a program.json, as well as a source folder. Let's open this up in VS Code. So if I hit write code dot, this will open this guy. I'll say, yes, I trust myself. And let's make this guy full screen. If I go into the source folder and just click on main.leo, let me make this bigger for everybody. It's no surprise there's a Hello World program there that just adds A and B into C and returns C. I can actually run this for you to kind of show you it running. I can write leo run on this. It will start compiling. Compilation here will probably take about 10 seconds is my guess. Under the hood, what's happening is that it's going to be synthesizing a predicate, as we talked about in the previous part of the talk, so like a polynomial, off of this, uh, this method, and using that to then produce a zero-knowledge proof. Um, and so it compiled it in about eight seconds on this MacBook Air, uh, and then it uh, executed here. Uh, and the execution was uh, three, uh, three seconds to, to execute, and uh, this produces the final output there. Uh, I think one of the first things that I want to do is, of course, uh, remove this main function since uh, we want to write a token contract. And um, as part of kind of what we just talked about, uh, tokens, we, if we want to own them privately, you can have a, a record. Uh, I will define a new record, which is, oh, I thought this was charging. One second. Okay, it's kind of charging. <laughs> All right, we can define a new record, token. We said that we have to have a few mandatory fields, so we can uh, define an address. We also want to define in it uh, its ability to hold money, which is Gates, U64. Um, and then lastly, uh, we want to say how many tokens. So let's just put an amount and call it uh, U64, why not? So this is, this is a record. It's a data structure that basically is holding um, balance in it. And the first thing we want to do is mint ourselves some money, right? So, uh, I can go into, uh, I can write transition mint. Uh, we want to put, for example, a receiver. Uh, that's an address. And I also want to put uh, an amount, an amount as a U64. And with that, I want to return a token record. What will I do from there? Well, it's actually fairly straightforward. I'm just going to write return token. And then I'm, I'm going to put the owner as myself, the receiver. Uh, we're not going to mint any money out of thin air, so you know, z zero gates. Um, and lastly, amount. Actually, we can just write amount. It'll recognize it. And we put a semicolon to finish it off. If I hit save and I open this up, we can now say, for example, I can, I can just compile it and just, oh, sorry. I must have forgotten a U there. There we go, U64. I can now just Leo build. And uh, it will compile this into, uh, into, into some files for you. So if we take a look at the build folder here, there's currently, it's synthesizing for us, so let's wait for it to finish. All right, so it synthesized this mint function for us. Let's take a look at the build folder, so let's see what came out of it. Well, the first is it came out with some alien instructions. This is what it compiled down into. You have your program token.alio, uh, there's that record that we just had, and then it has this function, mint. Notice that we're basically just, it's a cast instruction, which means we're issuing with these registers into this register R2 a new token, and then we're returning that, that, that second register R2 as the token record. 
Additionally, there's, there's a few files here. Uh, we have here this, uh, oh yeah, this is, yeah th this is probably left over, the main prover verifier. But we have mint.prover and mint.verifier. What are mint prover and mint verifier? Well, in this particular case, this is the, the proving key and the verifying key for the zero knowledge proof that we are going to, that we're executing. If we go back to this main piece of code here, I want to execute this. So let's issue myself some money. I actually have inside the program.json a development account already that was issued when I, when I wrote Leo new token. That address is what I'm going to pay myself to. So this, this is my alias address. I'm going to come back here. I'm going to write Leo run. We're going to call the mint function. I'm going to pass in, if you recall, you have to pass in a receiver and an amount. So the receiver is the address. Oh, I should, here, let me, let me put it higher up so we can see. I'm going to put in the address. And I don't know, let's issue myself 100, 100 tokens. So 100 U64. Let's hit Enter. And what it'll do is now it's taking that uh, proving key and verifying key that we just synthesized. Uh, and proceeding to use that to create a new record for me. And notice in the output, we now have a new record. There is owner, gates, and amount, just as the record defined. Notice there's also a hidden field called the nonce. The nonce is basically, uh, to your question earlier, the randomness that we use for the commitment. So when you commit, there is a piece of randomness that's deterministically generated using your account. This is that nonce. That nonce is what we pass in when we want to quote unquote hash the actual values. And with that, I now have a mint. Now let's say, all right, I have some, I have some money. I wanna, I wanna send it, what, what would I do? Well, let's write a transfer function for ourselves so we can start sending money, right? So th the natural way is to say, well, I wanna create a transition where I'm going to transfer using my record, so the sender's record, which is a token, the receiver, which is again, just the address, and an amount, which is gonna be a U64. We're gonna now return two things. So we're gonna return both the token, which is uh, a token record, which is for the payment, and if we have any leftovers, which is for myself, the leftover goes into another record, which is my, my new record. So I invalidate or I spend my old record, I now have a new record in my place. And logically, the first thing we want to do is to say, let's compute the, the remainder, the remaining difference. And so the remaining difference is, and let's just call it remaining, which is a U64, I can go sender dot amount minus the given amount. And I want to call out actually that this here is, uh, this operation is safe. And so for those who are coming from the Ethereum universe, this is already by default safe math. Uh, anything that uh, will uh, underflow in this particular case will cause the entire proof to fail. If it overflows, it will fail. Uh, if, if the balance is insufficient, basically it will fail. And so this operation is safe and I can just compute it as so. Now I want to issue the payment. So we can say let payment be of type token and I can define a new token where the owner is gonna be the receiver. So I'm sending this person some money. I'm not gonna give them any alio credits and so gates is zero. And lastly, we're gonna give them that amount. So that's the amount that we give there and this is for the receiver. Oops. Payment for the receiver. And lastly, we want to we want to send the send the remaining balance oops, back to the sender. So let's create the remainder. Oops, remainder. It's a token, and we're going to set that to be ourselves. So sender dot owner. Uh, we're going to give it. Whatever balance was in here comes back to myself. I'm not, I'm not gonna share there. And uh, lastly, uh, let's put the amount as the remaining. We'll close that off and now we can just return. Let's return the payment as well as the remainder. And that is the transfer function. Does that make sense? Uh, happy to take any questions here. Yes. Good question. So the high level is that in this particular example, uh, this is like writing an ERC-20 token contract, right? So I, I wouldn't want to actually send free money that's not the token itself to that person. Uh, and so in this case, I'm keeping the gates for myself. Um, this is effectively letting me keep any balance I held in the record for myself, but I'm issuing new currency for them. 
you can think about it like, uh, yeah, like, like any, it's like in, a, in an Ethereum smart contract, you can say, if I'm going to give you some ERC-20 tokens, I'm not giving you any Ether, right? Like Ether is also a special language construct that you can also provide if you wanted to. But uh, in an ERC-20, you wouldn't give them free Ether. You'd give them just the, just the tokens that you wanted to transfer with. Yeah, that's the intuition there. Uh, let's go ahead and build this. So let's, let's just run Leo build again. Um, you, you actually don't have to run Leo build. You can just run, uh, write Leo run, and if it's not compiled, it'll compile it automatically for you as well. But I just want to show you uh, the, the amount of time it takes to synthesize uh, so that you see it for yourself. Remember, synthesis is a one-time operation, and then you can, use, you can use and run as many times as you want. So we built that min function again. And now we're building the transfer function. The transfer is, as you saw, a little more sophisticated than the mint, and so it should take a little bit longer. And there you go, the transfer function's been built. And let's go and take a look at this. So this is now what the alien instructions for it look like. We basically just took R0, R1, and R2, and we first subtract. Again, this is safe. I also want to call out, for those who want the unsafe math, like, there is syntax for it, and you can just write, for example, in alien instructions, if you add the dot w command to it, uh, it, will, it means wrapping. So you will then go into the wrapping variant of you know, add dot w, sub dot w, mol dot w, div dot w, um, inv dot w. Like you, can just, you can then go to the wrap variant, and here you, you will have uh, the subtraction, and then we're creating two records. Uh, this was that payment record, and here was the uh, change amount, and then we output two records, r4 and r5, those registers. Uh, Let's send ourselves some money, or let's, let's send somebody some money. So uh, let me just create another address. So I, I can write alio account new, and uh, for those who have, who have finished install script, you can do this too. If you just write alio account new, uh, it will produce for you a new address uh, with a private key and view key. Um, so let's just send to this guy. So, oops. so we're going to write leo run transfer. Let's paste in the record that we just minted for ourselves. And let's uh, take this address, let's paste that, and let's send 10, 10 to this address. All right, let's just clear this up and hit end. Oh, shoot, sorry. Uh, okay, sorry, I need to put some quotes there, I forgot. This is terminal, so uh, quotes on the record. Let's just quote this guy. All right, so I'm gonna quote this guy, let's hit enter. So now we're gonna transfer some money. We're gonna transfer some money uh, to this other address. And voila, uh, we have now two outputs. As we mentioned, the first one is going to be the payment. The second one is going to be the, the remainder for myself. Uh, these, basically, as you can see, uh, this was my address going in. This is my address coming out. We said, give this guy some money. Oh, sorry, give this guy some money. And this guy received 10, as before, and I received 90. So that's, that's a basic token transfer there, and I hope that helps to give you an illustration. I want to walk you through uh, five more examples here, so there's, there's quite a bit more to go through. Uh, just before I do that, I want to do a quick check on everybody and seeing how they're doing on installing the workshop repo. Uh, is, is there any issues people are running into, or is it, are people still downloading parameters? Downloading parameters, all right. Uh, and just to refresh everyone, uh, when, when you reach the end, it will look something like this, uh, where uh, let's make this more visible for everyone. So it will look like that at the bottom. So it'll say installation complete. You can open a new terminal window to begin. I guess with that, let me just start by uh, running some examples. Uh, you can follow with the exact same steps. Uh, and uh, I'll just say for the next step here, oh, the battery might have died again. <laughs> uh, let's see, Ray. Can you uh, hit next on the slide there for that one? Uh, one more, one more. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so you can open in VS Code with this. Um, so you know, here, here I am in the workshop repo. I can just write code workshop. I actually have it open here, so it's, it's kind of already open. But um, let's just go through a few examples. The first one I want to show is tic-tac-toe. I think this is a straightforward game that people are familiar with. Tic-tac-toe, it's, it's a board. Uh, you have X's and zeros, or, or X's and circles, sorry, crosses and circles. And uh, your goal is to get three in a row uh, in any direction, horizontally, vertically, diagonally. Um, in order to do this, uh, we want to start by creating a board. And so the board is here on line, uh, line 19, uh, where you have three rows. And notice right above it, we have the rows themselves, which are composed of 
uh, U8s, uh, unsigned integers of eight bits. Uh, so there is uh, column one, column two, and column three. And together, we can create a function, uh, call it transition new, uh, which basically will create for you a new board. Uh, it will have in it uh, rows and columns, and it will be a three by three grid, all zeros. What we'll do is we'll denote player one with a one, we'll denote player two with a two. So when player one places on the board, uh, an X, it will be uh, a one. And then when player two places on the board a circle, it will be two. That kind of makes sense. <laughs> we have a helper function here. Notice we have now a new syntax, which is function. Functions are, uh, don't create state transitions. They're just logic. So you can just write logic, and it'll execute as you'd expect. Um, this is to logically check the possible ways you can win, which is did I get three in a row? Did I get three in a column? Did I get a diagonal on either side? Um, and if any of these are true, then you return true for this. Lastly, the complex one, which is, this is to make a move. So we start by asserting that you're either the first or the second player. Um, and again, that the rows and columns here. We want to update these entries into variables. And uh, from here, we want to do the logical check that we can make the appropriate move. If we can make the appropriate move, then we're going to update the board with the new appropriate moves, which are d denoted here. Lastly, with that updated board, we want to make a check before we finish whether any party has won the board at this point. And if so, we'll output either player one won, player two won, or nobody won. Uh, this is effectively how we're going to play this game. And so uh, fortunately, there is a script you can use, which is on the left here, run.sh, which will save us from having to manually type everything. I want to simulate the entire game of this. So let's cd into tic-tac-toe, and let's do run.sh. So I'm just going to hit run. We're going to start by creating a new board. So as you can imagine, uh, it's going to, oh, I guess we need to compile first. So let's let it compile. Um, but it will create a new empty board first. And with that board, um, we, can, we can now build, uh, well, an empty tic-tac-toe board. OK, we built both, both of them. All right, here we go. Now we're running. All right, so, OK, it'll move really quickly. So let me just slow it down by playing it, and then we'll watch the rest. So we start by creating a new board. Notice that the output here is that board, and it's, uh, it's basically 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. From there, we're going to make the first move, where the player is going to place an x in the upper left corner. And the function itself, as it shows, returned out uh, a 1 in that first column. So uh, row 1, column 1 is a 1u8, and everything else is still zeros. This is all being done with proofs, obviously. So you're getting transitions from this. Now the second player makes the second move. They place a circle. We denote, as we mentioned, as a two. And so notice now we have here uh, two there. Now player three makes, makes their next move. Player four makes their, or sorry, play, player one makes the third move. Player two makes the fourth move. Player one makes the fifth move. Player two makes the sixth move. Player one makes the seventh move. And we can just watch this finish. Uh, player two makes the eighth move. Player one makes the ninth move. And we have a tie game. And th that shows you the full execution in, in, in one go. Um, some things that are worth calling out. First off, this was creating a transition in every round. Uh, this example is not broadcasting it to chain. This was pure off-chain. And what's interesting about this is I can take these executions weave them into one transaction, and broadcast that on chain. We have a bound of up to, I believe currently it is 15 transitions in one transaction. Because this was nine moves in order to play the game and 10 that to technically set up the board, this can fit inside of one transaction. So what this means is I can actually play one full round of this game with a server offline or direct peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, and then broadcast the transaction on chain. What's interesting is that because I can do this off chain, I'm I'm forcing the other player to play based on my board state because I am basically giving them execution in a zero knowledge proof. They can't cheat off of that logic. Now you may ask, well, what if you want to withhold from the chain that broadcast? That's where you want to create a more sophisticated program where you say there's also a challenge period on there that says you have to produce a state update or you have to produce the result within X amount of time. So you create one transaction to first say I'm starting the game with the board. Then I can go off chain, produce a sequence that, play, that plays the whole game, and then broadcast it back on chain. And if you don't broadcast it within, say, 100 blocks, then, say, the money's returned to both parties or, or one, one, party, one party who reports 
gets the, gets the money and the other doesn't, for example. There's kind of different ways you can think about that. But th this is kind of an interesting construct for how you can start to create new types of games. Uh, if you think about like poker, for example, what I can do is I can deal a round of cards uh, uh, for, for the table, all players on the table. We can play one round with a transaction that's check or bet, for example, and then basically like just simulate transactions that are table games one, one round at a time. Uh, so it starts to give you a different type of computing construct than what you may be familiar with if you're coming from crypto. The next example I want to show is just a basic bank. So we already kind of went through a token example. I want to take you through a, a, a basic bank. Uh, uh, let's just say that there's a bank that you can deposit money into. So you have some money off chain. There's a bank on chain. You want to deposit some money into it. And then with that, it can issue you after certain periods of time, it can issue you interest. Well, for, for the case of this example, we'll fast track the whole thing so it will kind of run in one go. But let me just show you. We have here a familiar construct, that token from before. But now there's something new. There's something called a mapping. What is a mapping? Mapping is basically on-chain storage, as we mentioned previously. This is saying that I'm, I'm holding in here some unique ID, which, which is a field element in this case, so it's some number, uh, and I'm holding some balance with respect to that, that field element. With that, I can, as the bank, issue you, uh, issue you some tokens, which you can then take those tokens and deposit it on-chain into my bank. If you deposit into my bank, uh, notice that I have this new finalized scope here. So every, every transition has an optional case for finalize. I can call the finalized scope to increment, in this case, the balances mapping for this hash, this identifier, and increment it by a certain amount. By the way, there's work and proposals to basically change this syntax to be balances of hash, in this case, uh, plus equals amounts, which will then kind of synthesize down into that. But I just want to call out that that's what's really happening under the hood here, and we're, we're currently thinking through the, the, the syntax change to make it more intuitive. Um, this, is, this is to deposit. I can also withdraw from the bank, right? So I can, I can withdraw, and if I withdraw, then I'm basically going to issue out my tokens. We're also going to do something called calculate interest, and let's take a look at this calculate interest function that's here at the bottom. We're basically going to look at the, at the principal, and then we're going to look at the periods this bank, this account is a CD that happens to let you have up to 100 intervals. And uh, we then from there issue you an amount. Let's see this in action. So if I go back to terminal and I CD into basic bank, I can proceed to do run.sh. Oh, that went fast. All right, <laughs> step one is we want to initialize 100 tokens for this account. So uh, let's just break down what's happening here. There is actions at the top which are saying what's happening. There's a wallet here, which is off-chain, and then there's a bank that's on-chain, and here's the, here's the kind of running sum so we all kind of remember what the tally looks like. We're going to start by issuing ourselves 100, 100 tokens. We're also going to compile it first. I forgot about that. <laughs> so let's let the compilation run. Um, with this, the, the uh, bank itself uh, has an interest rate that's been hard-coded. We've hard-coded it to 12.34%. You could really put anything, but it's... It's pretty close to stable coin amounts, so. <laughs> um, all right, we're, we're almost done with the compilation. We need to finish withdraw, and then we'll be there. All right, wow, that withdraw. To calculate interest takes some time. All right, we're in business. Uh, so the first step is we want to issue for ourselves 100 credits. So we just issued 100. The next step we want to do is uh, we're going to go and deposit 50 from that wallet into the bank. So how are we going to do that? We're going to call, naturally, the deposit function. And the deposit function is going to proceed to show you, uh, uh, it's going to update the map with 50, and then it's going to give back 50. So now my, my account, my wallet off chain, has 50 left in it. From there, we're going to wait 15 periods. So now there's no action. We're just going to pretend time moved forward. Uh, we're going to fast track it. The balance should now be 266 in the bank. I should still have 50 off chain. And the total balance is now 316. We're going to withdraw that money. So now we're going to withdraw 266 from the bank. This means that the wallet should be netting out with 316 from 15 periods of interest. And here's the output from that. 
You can see off chain, I now have a record that has 266 based on calling the method withdraw from there. And so this gives you intuition into how you can execute with an on-chain, off-chain paradigm. Um, naturally, you can imagine that you want to wait those actual blocks to give you that. Um, there's a discussion in terms of the right syntax to actually uh, get block heights. And so currently, we've been discussing global.height as the syntax. Um, we'll be putting an arc out for this soon so that we can discuss it. Um, it's probably worth calling out where the arcs are. These are arcs. So this is the RFC process. Uh, we have here a few arcs. Arc 2 basically was what I was showing with all of the opcodes that we have here at the moment um, and their specifications. It's quite long, so I encourage you to read it on your own. Um, arc 3 is basically some of the syntax that we just described here. So this is some of the new syntax that's coming in, which, which we were, we've been demonstrating. And we're still discussing interfaces. We're still discussing things like accessing global state. Um, these are kind of the open constructs that we want to get feedback on. So if you have opinions, please go here uh, to the discussion, which is right here, uh, and chime in on this thread uh, where we can kind of continue the, 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 uh, the banter on you know, what, what the right syntax for this should be. I want to show you another example, uh, which is now, let's call it a voting contract. So let's go over to the vote. I'll save everyone a little time by going to vote and Leo building it first. All right, while that's, while that's building, let's just go through what this does. Here's a simple vote. This is more for illustration than anything, but uh, we have here a, a struct, which is proposal info, so we're now using structs here. Uh, which have a title, a content, and a proposer. We're encoding them as fields at the moment. Uh, you can kind of encode them what you want, but uh, we're using fields in order to keep it hash-based. Um, for proposals, uh, you can define in it an owner, the gates, uh, an ID, as well as the info. Um, we have a bunch of mappings here, which are to kind of show you, like in this case, the storage of tallies and what, it, what was agreed upon, what was disagreed upon. Uh, as well as the, 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 the state of that, of that tally, which we're, which we're keeping here as, uh, as public for the proposal itself. Notice that because the record here is private, then yeah, like that's, that's part of, the, that's part of the, the hidden state. We have a method called propose. We check that the caller itself, so self.caller, is the, is the uh, claimed proposer here, which then allows you to generate a proposal ID. And with that, I can then, then finalize that state into a proposal. We can also issue new tickets. We can also agree and disagree using our tickets. So it's a kind of a natural construct for how you'd, you'd create a ballot and, and do voting. Let's run this now. Let's clear out state, run.sh. We're gonna compile the vote program. We're proposing a new ballot. Then the ballot happens to have two fields, a yes and a no. We'll do a quick example to just show you what it looks like. We initialize the board by proposing this with a new ticket. Uh, currently, it's zero and zero. Now, we're going to vote yes with one ballot, and you get an increment uh, but just by executing this. Oh, and uh, I guess that's it, and we, we voted. You could also do a vote and disagree. Um, but hopefully, this helps to show you this example here. And lastly, let's see. Oh, we could do the auction. Yeah, let's do the auction, and then we're running out of time. Let's do the auction, and let's do battleship. Uh, I'll do, do these quickly. So let's go into the auction. Let's, oops, let's see the auction. Leo built. All right, what is the auction? Let's just do a quick look at it. The auction basically is a sealed bid auction. Uh, you have here the bidder, or sorry, the bid with a bidder. It's a managed auction, so uh, the auctioneer will actually denote the, who, which bid is the winner at the end of this. Uh, so this is a, a system where on chain you can have a party who is the auctioneer who will finalize based on the winner. You can start by placing a bid as so. You can also resolve, which is the, it's, just, it's like, it's like a, a reduce function. So you take kind of two to one uh, and you can basically figure out who is the winner based on this. We're going to call this once to kind of show you that. And then the auctioneer uh, on chain will take the final winning bid and place a marker that says you are the winner. And you can then Use that, for example, to go claim an NFT or whatever asset you want on chain with that. So we are here compiling, and I think it's the last method now. Yep, it's the finish method we're compiling. All right, let's run this guy. So in this case, we start by initializing a new two-party auction. The first bidder places a bid of 100, or 10, sorry. The second bidder places a bid of 90. And naturally, 90 is greater than 10, so the auctioneer will go ahead and say, this is the winner. 
Once, that, once that's declared, then you basically re call resolve, which will reduce these two into just that, re that remaining winning bid. And then you complete the auction by issuing out the final version of that bid record, which you saw here where is winner is true. You could, for example, have a parent program that calls into this program with an inter-program inter call. Uh, so I can import and then, and then use, which then can check that bid.isWinner is true. And if so, then give them the asset, for example. And lastly, I want to go to Battleship, and this will finish us off. All right, so Battleship, uh, let's, let's let it compile. Um, Battleship is, is actually a very elaborate example, and let me just show you guys um, the diagram for what's going to happen here, because it's, we won't play the full game, we'll play the first few steps. Um, it, it's quite a lot. So this is a, these are the first few steps here. Um, basically, player one comes and is going to create a new board. It's an empty board. Player one is going to place their pieces on the board and encrypt it under their address. They're then going to hand the board over to player two. Player two is going to then place the, their pieces on the board and encrypt it under their address. And then their, player two is going to hand the board back to player one. Now player one has a board where both sides is encrypted under their own respective boards. With that, player one is going to be able to execute the first move. They're going to shoot a fire over to the other side, to player two's board. They're basically committing to a message, effectively, of saying, I want to hit this position on the grid. With that, player two then takes the message and decrypts their board and determines whether a hit was made or not. They'll hit that piece, that, that, that place on the board. With that, we then update game state on player two's side by re-encrypting it and sending the board back to, or to, to player two to, to create a message and sending that back to player one so that player one decrypts player two's message. And they then proceed to do the exact same action of saying hit or miss. With that, they then encrypt their board, send it back to player two. They do their move back and forth. There's a total of four pieces in this example. Uh, there's, a, there's a piece that is, uh, that's two, two, two spots, one that's three spots, one that's four spots, and one that's five spots. Five plus four plus three, uh, three plus two is 14. So in total, this would take 14 rounds of back and forth to play a full game here. Let's see, where are we now? We're just finishing on the compilation here. I want to show you the source code for this. There's, it's, it's quite an elaborate example, and this is the first time we've seen the import syntax. So we're importing here some programs here for a generic board, for the operation to move, and also the ability to, to verify your move on a piece. We can initialize the board, which has in it a carrier, battleship, a cruiser, and a destroyer. These are those lengths of five, four, three, and two, as well as the address of the opponent. You'll proceed to basically, in this case, execute. This is the parameters for it. So it's of size five, uh, it has some placement details on it. Let's go into verify. There we go, the horizontal and vertical position of that ship, so that's what that is there. And uh, they can initialize the board state with this information right here. Uh, offer Battleship basically says I'm going to offer that board. Uh, start Battleship is to actually start the game, so this is after you've placed your pieces, you start the game with that. Um, you can, you know, play is to actually make the move. Um, and. Uh, there's the is hit, for example, and the next move, and you would return the next board with the next move, and the next player takes the board with the move and decrypts and per performs the same update logic of hit or miss. Um, we have here also a move.alio file, which is the actual logic for producing that move, and as well as to verify. Uh, you would validate chip, and also you can, yeah, there's the create board logic that you saw earlier. Um, these are the row checks and adjacent G checks, as well as the bit count checks, game logic. Um, I think we're almost done with building this. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very long example, but uh, I, I encourage you to check out this code in detail because it shows you kind of a more, more interesting scheme for how to use, use this to create an interactive game. Um, I want to call out that even though you can fit this in 14 rounds, you can then fit in a transaction, a game like this would likely want you to actually do it on-chain because you want to validate the encryption at each step so that you're not, you know, like, the, the encryption off-chain for these parties is correct, but on-chain, you may want to keep that state so that the other party can access it from a simple place. Sometimes if you're, if you're getting a board that, of this size, it may not be as efficient to transmit it locally and you want to get it from a reliable source. Um, there's many reasons also from a, 
challenge period to make sure that each party is staying live for a game like this, and you can then do this on-chain. Um, the first step that we're gonna do here is to initialize the board. And once we've had that, we have here uh, the state record for that. We then can proceed to say, player one is gonna pass the board to player two. I'll just let this play on its own now. Uh, and as we kind of mentioned before, we're offering that board over to player two, so that player two can then place their, their pieces there. Player two is now placing their pieces on the board. By the way, I should call out the reason you're seeing validate ship four times is because there's four pieces. So every time you're placing a ship on the board, that's one call to validate ship. You can see these takes under two seconds for each of these individual executions. This then gets passed back to player one, and they're almost ready to start the game. So we call start board, we call start game. And now player one takes the first turn. So we start by updating the play tiles, updating hit or misses, and then we create our move. With that, we create the move, we send that back over to player two. Player two now takes that move and basically, well, takes the next step in Battleship. This goes on for two more turns before this finishes. Uh, I hope this shows you kind of what Battleship looks like in a game like this. Uh, I'm running out of time. I just want to finish off with the last, uh, last few things. Uh, this repo is all open source. It's available on alio.hq uh, slash workshop on GitHub. Um, there's also uh, another repo that may be of interest to folks. If you go uh, to my repo here and you go to Awesome Alio, um, there's a curated list of different things that might be of interest for you. So um, if you're interested to keep in touch with us, um, we have a Discord channel as well as Twitter. There's also a, an unofficial community run uh, newsletter for this week, uh, updates, weekly updates. There's also tutorials on um, you know, how to, how to kind of understand the model in, in further depth from what I explained today, um, as well as um, presentations and talks from myself, from others on the team. Um, there's also research papers, uh, core libraries, and, uh, and development tools here. Um, that, this is that disassembler I was mentioning, which can you know, take bytecode and uh, bring it over into alien instructions. Um, there's also ZPRIZE, which is hardware acceleration to make zero knowledge proofs faster. So uh, for those who were asking earlier about uh, being able to kind of run this on dedicated machines, like you can take this and execute this on you know, GPUs or on FPGAs, which can help to speed up the execution that you just saw from this MacBook Air. Um, we also have a playground where you can also, uh, like, if you don't want to install this stuff, you can also do it in the browser. And here's kind of the, the same kind of example that we just saw there with the Hello World. And you can run it, run it in the browser here as well. Um, in terms of the syntax highlighters, we have, you know, support for different IDEs. And in terms of applications, a early and very curated growing list of things that are, that are going on. People are trying, like, to build bridges or explorers, identity and auth of credential-based things, games, uh, governance stuff. I'm very interested in machine learning and Oracle fields. If people want to help fill that in, uh, I would love to see pull requests on that front. So just make a GitHub repo with whatever your idea is and I'll be happy to take a look at it. Um, there's a kind of basic example of, a, of that auction that we saw. And then there's some wallets that are currently under work and I believe that the Entropy folks who are going to be coming up next will actually give a live demo of this. So um, with that, my time is up. I wanna say thank you to, for all of your time and attention. I hope this was helpful and interesting and I hope you guys were able to install Leo and Ailer on your machines. Thank you very much. Cool, so I think um, Javier and Matias, if you wanna go ahead and set up and then you can just get started with your demo. Hello, just let me <laughs> get some good internet to to get the demos working. Yeah, we'll do the setup, and then we can start. Let me 
you the rest. Right. Yeah, and Are before we you, I was gonna say before you guys start, if you want to give a quick intro on like entropy in yourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. of course. Uh, so I'm Javi. Uh, this, this might be. Uh, we're for, we're in from entropy 1729. Um, we're mostly from Argentina, Barcelona, and currently we're working uh, with Alio, building a whole bunch of different things, uh, including the Explorer, uh, the wall, uh, a wallet, uh, this roulette that we're going to show here. Um, and we're also writing some blog, po blog posts. You might have seen some of them. Um, yeah, so the idea here is to showcase some of the things we've been working on. Um, yes, we are going to show- Do you guys want an extra mic, by the way? We are going, we are going to show two, two examples, two, de two demos. We are going to, one is off-chain, and the other one is on-chain, so, so we are going to see some on-chain action. But let's start with, with this one. This is a roulette game. Uh, this is a, a, a client application, and we have a server where we have an um, isolated version of uh, instance of the SNAR VM working, so we can make uh, some computation on, um, with zero knowledge. So let's give it a try. We're going to select a number. We're going to bet on, on the number four. Let's say 10 tokens. We're going to spin the roulette. This is uh, light computation. It's, this is uh, exactly the, the, um, the amount of time it takes to generate the proof. Yeah, so in the background, this is running a circuit, alias circuit. Yes, and um, probability, probability is uh, against us, so we lose. <laughs> we lost. And now we can see we lost uh, the 10 tokens we, we bet, and the casino won that 10 tokens. Uh, so this is a, a really easy example. This is very similar to the examples Howard uh, showed just a couple of minutes ago, but with an interface and, and, a, and an application uh, running on, on a server. This is open source software. You can check it here in our GitHub um, account, Entropy1729. You can give it a, a look or a try if you want. You can install this on, on your PC too. And next. Let's move to the wallet. Right now, do you want to explain? Oh, yeah, sure. So we're about to showcase uh, the wallet. This is on the Chrome Store, I believe. Yeah. It's still MVP. Um, but this is, uh, so what we're going to show here is currently running on uh, one of our nodes, so on our own testnet. Uh, this is basically because we have a few changes that still need to be merged. Um, but they will be soon there. They, they will soon be on the actual testnet so that everyone uh, can use it. Uh, um, yes. Oh, let's get started. Uh, we have two wallets here in different browsers. We are going to create two accounts. You need to put a password. This is this is now the, now this is uh, our account. This is generated uh, via a WebAssembly module that has some SNRVN useful uh, functionality. So this is generated client side. Yeah. So for context, SNRVM is the Alio VM, so it's where the, most most of the Alio code lives right now. Um, Let's create another one. As you can see here, when we create a, a new account, you you don't have credit. But for that purpose, we have a public faucet working here to send credit to, to uh, our new generated account. This is only possible because we are on testnet. This is not in, in production. So let's send some credits to our account. This, this just take a couple of seconds. Yeah, this takes a little while because it's you know running the proof and then sending the transaction to get the funds. Uh, so pretty soon it should be done. I'm guessing is if this is working. Let me check. Let's try it again. And submit. It is running. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 
Okay, yeah, there we go. go. This is our transaction ID. In a couple of seconds, we are going to, to show uh, this transaction on the Explorer, how it's going to, to show us. But let's, let's get into our account again with our password. And now we should have uh, 100 tokens. It's loading, okay. And now let's make a, we are going to make a transaction and, and next how it's going to explain to, to everyone here how the transaction, where the transfer works. So let's put some here. We are going to open our account. So let's copy this address. Let's put it here. We are going to send yeah, 10 credits. Send. It's asking for a password again for protection. And now we are going to confirm our, uh, our transaction. And now it's sending. Let's wait a couple of seconds. This is uh, generating a, a transaction in, 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 in the server, and, it's, and then it's being broadcast to the blockchain. So it takes a couple of, of seconds. There we go. This is our transaction. Now, if we go here again, we should have 10 credits. Yeah, so just to give some context, so the balance calculation takes a little while, and the reason for that is something that I think Howard sort of talked about in the other talk, where to calculate balance, you actually have to fetch all the records on chain and see what, uh, which ones belong to you, and then you know calculate the amount of money you have, and that takes a little while. Um, so that's why you're seeing that. Here, is, if we click here, we can see uh, our transaction on the, in the Explorer. Javi, do you want to explain? Yeah, so now that uh, this is the transaction on the Explorer, so just to give a quick rundown on it, um, and also like the record model that uh, Howard uh, talked about. So this is the transaction that um, Mati just made. This is a transfer transaction, so it's, just, it's basically just sending money from one party to the other. Uh, but what that looks like in Alio is that this is actually calling a function on this program, uh, which is the credits program, which is a built-in program on the blockchain. Um, so we're, that program has a bunch of functions, but the one we're calling right now is transfer, of course. Um, this is the proof for it. And then the idea here is, you can see here it says transactions. So this is, a, th sorry, this is, it says transitions. Uh, and the reason for this is each transaction can actually consist of, consist of multiple transitions. You can think of them as essentially state changes. Um, right now there's only one, um, but that's, that's the intuition. Um, yeah, and the idea here is uh, below you have the records because essentially transferring money is you take an input record uh, on this, this record model that Howard talked about. So in this case, records are basically, they have an owner and they have an amount of credits. Um, so you have to take a record, spend it, and then send, and then create a new one, or new ones in this case, uh, for, you know, to send money. So if I want to send uh, five credits, I spend my record, let's say it has 10, and then I create two new ones. One record's for the receiver with five credits, and then another record's mine again. Um, so these are the inputs. This is, this is the record that Mati spent. And these are the other two inputs. These are not records, but they're, uh, this is the address of the receiver, and this is the value, which is encrypted, um, and this is the amount of money, also encrypted. Uh, the idea here is the only one that should be able to see this is the person with the view key, the person that it corresponds to. Um, so the idea here, we don't have this yet, but the idea is you should be able to click here to decrypt it if it belongs to you. This is what, what private means when you're writing your Leo programs, as Howard showed a couple of uh, minutes ago. When you have a private uh, output or, or input, uh, this is what you get on the blockchain, I ciphertext. And in order to decrypt that, you need your view key. And your, and your view key is private, so anyone, uh, no one can see it. Yep, that's the idea. And then the, these are the output records, the two records that, that were generated from this transaction. Again, they're encrypted, uh, they have an ID. That's, that's the idea. Um, and then just to go through the rest of the flow real quick, it's what you'd expect. Uh, you have, uh, you can see blocks 
Uh, you can see validators, although that's not really in place yet, so it's mostly mocked because we're not we're in phase one yet uh, still. Um, you can see transactions, and you can see you'll you'll be able to see programs deployed. Currently, there's none, so there's actually one, which is the uh, credits one, because this is our own our own testnet. Um, but you should be able to see here uh, programs people uh, deployed and see the instructions and that sort of thing. Um, and we have the Connect Wallet that that's still uh, being worked on. It's not yet in place, um, but pretty soon you'll be able to actually connect with the wallet. Yes, it, it is going to be available soon. Yeah. And the last thing I should mention is this is our own uh, Dev uh, Explorer for testing, but you can check you can check out the official one here. Um, does the actual um, real testnet for you explore? Yeah, so that's that's basically uh, the explore. Yes, if you want to try uh, uh, the first release version of the wallet, you can go to the Chrome Web Store and you can actually install it on Google Chrome. Uh, this is a, a preview version. It, it doesn't have transfers uh, yet, but you can create accounts and, and so on. So if you want to give it a try, you just let, uh, search for <laughs> Elio Wallet on, on Google, and you will find it. So I think that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, so uh, anyone have any questions? Yeah. One microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how is the story for uh, an app to access the state uh, that's uh, stored for a particular user? Is there a, like a web API that's being added through the Elio wallet? Or you have to connect to a full node or something like that? So what's the question? How do you access uh, your own state? Yeah. Yeah, so the idea is um, you have uh, a node should have an endpoint, which uh, if you give it your view key, your view key is the key that allows you to decrypt things or uh, be able to tell if something belongs to you. Uh, so there's an endpoint where you can ask uh, for the uh, records that belong to you. Um, those, will, those will come encrypted, but then you can decrypt them. Um, that's the main idea. Uh, yes, so uh, it actually is a program called Record Scanner. Pablo over there uh, <laughs> is working on, on that. So yes, that's, that's the idea. Did that answer the question? <laughs> we can talk about it later. Uh, More questions? Uh, great. Okay. Well, uh, so thank I, you. Sorry, yes. I, I want to add one more thing. So uh, we're working on a few more things, but one thing that we're working on is like uh, being able to deploy and execute arbitrary programs uh, on chain. Um, so if you want to see that, or if you have any other questions, you can come to us. Um, yeah, we can talk. Great. Yep. Thank you, everyone.